Like many of us, I grew up with The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings as bedtime stories, one chapter a night usually. Those books have been part of my life literally for as long as I can remember. There is no beginning, they were just always there. When I got out into the real world, I was really surprised to learn that there were people who knew way more about Middle Earth than I did. Recently, I've started playing Middle Earth strategy battle game on the tabletop, and it occurred to me that being a Tolkien fan is actually an immersive RPG in which you play a scholar uncovering the secrets of a fantasy world. Here's what I mean. I used to think, incorrectly, that Tolkien had written four books, The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I incorrectly, figured that the other stuff released after his death was probably a cash grab, and that rabid fans that developed over decades had managed to overanalyze it all until there was so much content about what could have been that it seemed like there was more to Middle-earth than what Tolkien had actually produced. I was wrong. I resisted delving further into Tolkien's work because, frankly, his writing style isn't particularly dynamic, sorry, and as far as I understood, much of it was posthumous anyway, so I considered it basically non-canon. I recently read the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien, n not the expanded edition yet at least, and boy did it set me straight. I'm not coming to any new conclusions here. It's spelled out in his letters, but it's new to me, so I'm making a video about it. Tolkien didn't write just four books. He published four books, and frankly, they were an ancillary project to his true-life work of role-playing as a historian for a make-believe world. When people wrote to Tolkien to ask him about some minor detail of Middle-earth, he didn't just, like, make stuff up. He'd already made stuff up, and he was able to draw from his knowledge of his imaginary setting to provide 100% consistent answers. The genealogies and history of people and places and things, they remain constant. He knew the travel times between key locations. He knew the phases of the moon during specific events in the books. For him, Middle Earth was real. I mean, not really real, but real. I think on some level, Tolkien did want to write more more books. That was definitely his intent. That's clear from his correspondence with his publishers, but I think he was compelled to just write history and lots of letters. I think deep down he didn't feel the need to be a novelist. I mean, on a lazy afternoon with nothing better to do, I personally doubt Tolkien sat down to work on a novel. If anything, I bet he worked on something that today we would call world building. At the time, though, there was kind of no other option than being a novelist for somebody who wanted to tell a fantastic story. There was no concept of world building back then. A lot of people today aren't even aware of the concept. You probably are, but you're watching this video. A lot of people don't know that that's a thing. I read a lot of lore, and some of my friends are not just a little confused about why I spend so much time learning about imaginary places instead of just like, you know, reading a history book about ancient Rome or Egypt or whatever. That's another video all its own, but there was literally no other format to convey his ideas at the time. There wasn't a market for history books about a world that didn't exist. It's still a niche market today, but it wasn't something people could even conceptualize back then. When Tolkien started his project, the term fantasy as a literary genre didn't even exist. He called his work fairy stories, like fairy tales, fairy stories, because there just wasn't another term for them. I tried to do a little research to find out when the term fantasy became the term that we used for these things, and I can't find it. I don't, I don't know when that actually arose. Tolkien died before the 1980s, so when he invented an imaginary world and obsessed over it down to the last detail, he had two choices at best, novels or serialized magazines. In the 1980s, of course, tabletop role-playing games took off and suddenly there was a new medium, the RPG source book. There was, all of a sudden, a completely new market for fantastic fiction, whether it was what had become known as fantasy or sci-fi or more broadly speculative fiction. Looking at Tolkien's body of work can be intimidating for a few reasons. First, there's a lot of it. Second, he never had reason to collate it all into a coherent masterwork. And third, the attempts he made to express it through novels outside of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings and a few short stories published during his lifetime were left unfinished. Where do you even start? Well, 
One way is to view it as a role-playing game. Your game master, J.R.R. Tolkien himself, has created a setting, and I'm not talking about Middle-earth. The setting of the Tolkien Legendarium is the real world, and you're the player character. You gain experience points by gathering data about an ancient world. You've heard it referenced as Middle-earth. You probably don't know the name of the continent or the planet. Maybe that's the first clue you need to find. Or maybe it's irrelevant and what you really need to know is how it started, what entity created it. Or maybe that doesn't matter and all you really care about are who populates the world. It doesn't matter where you start and realistically, most of us start with The Hobbit and then The Lord of the Rings, but to get past level four, let's assume one book is one level, you have to look around. That's the game. It's an escape room filled with books. Find the clues, earn the lore master achievement. Back in film school, my professors used to say, I can't grade what's not on screen. It was a rule that was intended to forestall the hapless student who shot hours and hours of really great footage, except a lighting stand was in the shot all along, so they have to leave it on the cutting room floor. The footage doesn't count. You're not graded on intent, you're graded on results. I used to unjustly apply that rule to Tolkien. I looked at his body of work and saw a bunch of pages left on the cutting room floor. That was the wrong way to look at it. All that quote-unquote unfinished work is the work. It's not unfinished because when is anything truly finished anyway? What official stamp do you need to signify that a project is complete? Tolkien didn't feel like he needed one. He kept working on his world in one form or another pretty much until his death. Playing the role-playing game of Tolkien's work means you get to read his source books, cobble together his clues, correlate the timelines, maybe even learn a new language if you want. At one time, that seemed like a lot of work to me. Learning a new language it still does. But it felt like people were picking up the pieces of an author who didn't bother writing into his books the story he wanted to tell. But actually, the author did tell his stories. If Tolkien were alive today, he'd be the guy on the internet running his own wiki for his fictional setting. He'd be an RPG developer writing source books and a fair few splat books for his own low magic setting. Which actually, I have thoughts about how low magic his world is. That's a separate video too. I guess I'd have been the sucker to have missed out on his Kickstarter because I didn't understand. I didn't get it. But now I I get it. There is no game. There is only lore. In reality, Tolkien was a clever guy at a writing desk. He corresponded with people far and wide about that imaginary world over the medium of handwritten letters typed later in life when his right arm was giving him trouble, and he kept the receipts. He wrote stuff down. He kept up his portfolio. It wasn't all done in a format that would make sense as a published volume, maybe, but the work exists. And now that we as an audience understand that it's okay to just indulge in a make-believe history story, we can join in on the role-playing game that is the discovery of his lore. It's uncovering all the secrets hidden both in plain sight and in works rescued from his study, posthumously. At the end of this game, you don't necessarily get to call yourself a Tolkien scholar, but you're at least an RPG nerd playing a game that's so meta that it's both real-life research and the same refreshing waste of time as memorizing the stat blocks of your favorite Pathfinder dragon. In the game, you are your character, and you're studying the archives of Middle-earth as passed down from ancient antiquarians, Bilbo Baggins himself included. Parse it, collate it, and emerge with an understanding of a place that never existed, but that's as magical as ever to visit. Thanks for watching.